Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we discuss HOAs. But first a story from Lincoln Hawks 1, can go on your beach? Lawyer up and dig into old timey law. Jackie Kennedy Onassis had a house on Martha's Vineyard near my grandparents place. My single mom of five was a school teacher so we ourselves weren't remotely wealthy. Why do we always decide to use this caveat like people are judging me negatively? Judge away if you like. She had a private beach with guards on the beach. The only person who ever did this on the strip of private beaches. No trespassing. My grandfather's lawyer friend didn't like the private beaches being more private. Lack of self-awareness here. At the time, a share of his and my grandparents' beach was worth $50,000. Now worth $300,000. So they did some research. The law in Massachusetts said that the people who are fishing or shell fishing can access any beach. So, he bought us little plastic beach buckets and shovels to carry with us the next time we took a beach walk with him. The guards tried to stop us. He said, I'm just trying to go clamming with my friend's grandkids. You know, shell fishing. They called up to the house and the head of security called the police. The police laughed when he told them that these scummy looking people were trying to calm on Miss Kennedy's beach. Relayed by the mom's friend who worked at the town hall. Collocated with police and not a lot exciting happens. Obviously, we got a lot of glee out of this for three kids under the age of 10, so the memory's strong. The guards sheepishly led us on the beach. Grandfather's friend laughed and basically told them to get screwed. Never had issues going on the beach afterwards. Also, Jackie O tried to build an addition that was much taller than allowed by the town law. People did that stuff all the time over winter, but she pushed it a little too far. Town made her rip the top off and lower the roof. This said, she was allegedly pretty nice. She didn't want paparazzi hounding her when she was on vacation. The family was a Martha's Vineyard institution, but Caroline basically stopped coming when John Jr. died. So much tragedy. You know, having been the wife of former President John F. Kennedy, it doesn't really surprise me that Jackie Kennedy has guards on their private beach. Even if it was like a little ridiculous to enforce the private beach there, after a lifetime of experiencing what they did, it's just hard for me to really blame them. When you have beach or oceanfront property, do you think it should even be possible that you have a private section of that beach? Do you think that's something people should legally be able to own, considering it's right there on the waterfront? Or is that just a little over the top, a little ridiculous? I'd like to know what you guys think down in the comments below. Our next story is from Willext. Want me to rubber band everything? Okay. I, 19 year old female, am the youngest person working at a very popular makeup store. There's a manager we'll call Z, early 20s female, who's supposed to just be managing stock, but acts like she's the manager over the entire store. I've been only working there a month, whereas she's been working there since the grand opening about 9 to 10 months ago. On to the situation. Saturday, I was tasked to separate every lip product in three different brands by shade and rubber band the same shades together. They were all overstock, and since I'm still new, I don't exactly know where all the brands go in the storage room. When I was finished rubber banding, the conversation went as follows. I say, hey, Z, where should I put all these lip products? They say, you rubber banded them all? I say, yes, all except, they say, I told you to rubber band them all and then put them up. I say, but the, come find me when you're done doing what I originally asked you to do. I'm sure you can guess what I did next. I rubber banded every lone lip shade I could. I even double rubber banded a few of them because why not? This took an extra 20 or so minutes, but it was done with a smile. When I finished, it was the end of my shift. I went up to the front to clock out and Z asked me if everything was rubber banded like I was supposed to do to start with. I smiled to myself while saying yes and explained why the products weren't put in their designated spots yet. She assured me to go ahead and clock out for the day and she would put everything where it should go. The cherry on top, this was 30 minutes before closing and she was left by herself to close. When I went into work yesterday, she didn't exactly say anything to me about the situation. She did make a comment about how she was glad she didn't have to go in early since she had to stay longer than she thought the night before. I wasn't tasked to sort anything yesterday, just stocking on the main floor and leaving the box of overstock in the storage room. I don't think I'll have to sort through anything anymore, unless I'm the last person. For some reason, it seems like there's way too many of these people who are just totally hot-headed and don't take literally any second to allow anybody to say anything 
that end up in the managerial or somewhat managing positions. How do you have a manager like this who just shuts down anybody at the mere suggestion that they might have a question? By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next story is from OK13240, okay another HOA story. This was about 10 years ago, 2010-ish. My family lived in a very nice gated community with an HOA. It was during the summer, and most weekends we would bring out our boat to the house on Friday nights to take out on Saturdays, and then move it back to where we stored it Saturday night. HOA had a rule where you aren't allowed to keep boats within view of the street. Our driveway ran up beside the house, and we'd intentionally position it to be as invisible as possible for the one night it would be there. Basically all that was visible was a small T-top over my dad's truck. Our HOA was actually pretty awesome, super laid back and really only did anything when there was a complaint. It was a relatively small neighborhood, less than 50 houses, and the HOA was really good at throwing monthly parties where we'd shut down a cul-de-sac, and everyone would bring food and music and we'd all have fun. This was kind of what an HOA is supposed to be, in theory, a good thing. Well, Karen had made a complaint to the board about our boat and had provided time-stamped photos of multiple violations. Mind you, one night a week, but she'd claimed it was consistent. The president came by to tell us, and it wasn't there when he was. We told him our side of the story. Basically, it was only there for about 12 hours on the weekend, and he said he nor anyone on the board had ever noticed it, but since they had a complaint, they had to request we remove it. I completely doubt they'd actually fine or do anything past asking, but rules are rules. Cue my father's mastery of the art of malicious compliance. Well, an important bit of information about this piece of property. When the neighborhood was built, my dad bought the house, as well as a property bordering the back of ours that was not part of the HOA, or in the neighborhood, and originally had a small chain link fence between it and the house. It was accessible through a small street with a few homes on it bordering our neighborhood. Well, my dad's beautiful brain started thinking about it, and for the cost and inconvenience of storing it at a storage place, he could probably just build a pad for it behind the house. He had a gravel pad put in the corner of the property with a shed over it, intentionally as close to the edge of the property so it would preserve the view out the back, or be very visible from the front of the house, either one. There wasn't any real backlash about it. Apparently Karen brought it up again, and the board politely informed her that they had no control over that property. And I think she admitted defeat. The board actually found it pretty funny, and never had any other issues with them. Karen moved about a year later, and my parents moved about two years ago. Love the neighborhood though, genuinely a positive HOA experience. Just an annoying Karen to make life inconvenient. If I didn't need another reason to hate on HOAs, not only can the board managers or the people who run the HOA be awful, all I need is this reminder that it takes just one Karen neighbor to report you and rules are rules, sorry we gotta follow them. You wanna have fun with a boat one night a week? Well you better not do it in our neighborhood, monster. Our next story is from Flavius Lascivius, HOA, a mansion, and the view. I lived in this town surrounded by magnificent vistas. There was a small development on the outskirts for upscale homes and mansions. Below the development were a few older homes. Many celebrities and business owners had vacation properties in the area, multi-million dollar houses they used maybe one month out of the year. Real estate had always been at a premium. There was one older home amongst all these giant view lots. A new buyer was a guy who owned a slew of RV dealerships and had obscene amounts of money, so he bought the most prominent lot on the top of the hill as you entered the development of maybe 20 lots. His project was a massive stucco structure with a multi-car garage and a much bigger RV storage space with a huge roll-up garage door. Think of the biggest RVs you've seen and he had a garage built for it with an automatic door. The house was a nondescript sand color with a red tiled roof, and the entire lot was tastefully landscaped with different kinds of rocks, small mounds here and there, and a few shrubs to be low maintenance. The back of the property was fenced in with an 8 foot or higher block wall. The fence itself probably cost $100,000. His neighbor was a school teacher who had lived there before the development started and had a modest house. 
he decided to take advantage of the skyrocketing land prices in the neighborhood and sell, except no one wanted his crappy house when there were much larger empty lots available. He decided that the real issue was that the new behemoth blocked his view, and that's why no one wanted to buy his three-bedroom ranch house at mansion prices. It was really that his home didn't appeal to the market. So he became the president of the HOA, which included the older homes and the new development, and then the harassment started. The HOA had formed after the RV mansion construction had begun, but the home was so big it took almost a year to finish. The HOA had passed a design theme rule that all houses must be painted in a specific color palette, with the predominant color being a taupe that was darker than this man's standard beige stucco color house. The palette included the taupe and a selection of trim colors in pink, teal, or tan. It was intended to give the community a Santa Fe look and feel, which just happened to be the colors of the president's crappy house. The RV owner took the HOA to court, and the trial dragged on for a year. The guy never used the property, claiming it was still under construction during this time. He lost in court and had to repaint his property using only the design-themed approved colors. So the guy brought out his contractor and had him repaint the entire property the Pepto-Bismol pink trim color. Everything was painted this color. The house, the fence, the trim, and the rocks in the yard. Then he had the massive driveway to the garage done in the same pink stamped concrete. Even the garage doors were pink. He locked up the house and never stayed there. The HOA was in an uproar because this house could be seen at the top of the hill for miles. None of the other lot owners broke ground. The president's home didn't sell for two years. I mean, it's crazy good revenge against a total jerk if you've got the money for it, but I'm kind of left here wondering what the legality was of basically breaking ground on this giant mansion and then, like, near completion, that's when the HOA takes over and can now dictate what you can and can't do? At what point did that HOA get factored into the original plans of this house? All I know is that dude had some fat stacks money and they weren't afraid of what anybody thought about it. Our next story is from Weakness Fabulous. No admin privileges? Okay, no problem. So I'm a tier 2 tech. For non-techies, it means I do most of the actual fixing of things at a company. Tier 1 handles real basic stuff like password unlocks. They also make sure the user has the computer plugged in and powered on, etc. You know, the first line of troubleshooting. Tier 3 tends to do root cause analysis, finding major issues and digging down to figure out why they happen and how to resolve them going forward. Tier 2 is everything in between. All tiers have some overlap. So recently I started a new position, and in this field, and my role, job security unfortunately doesn't exist. I really like the company and my new coworkers quite a bit. Very happy to be here. That doesn't mean they don't deserve a little malicious compliance just to get things started on the right foot. Since tier 2 techs often have a very wide range of responsibilities, we need certain administrative privileges to perform our job. But we never have what we need to start. We acquire what we need over time. Every company's like this, I think. So from day one, I ask for admins to do things for me. Setting up a new computer? Hey admin, please verify system can see my new machine. Hey admin, please make sure encryption key saved. Hey admin, can you add user to this group or that group? Hey admin, please verify the new computer's registering in the security software, etc, etc, ad nauseum. That's just the start. They want me to start handling tickets. Multiply the above by a hundred. I always seem to get the privileges I need faster than the other new techs. I wonder why. In a somewhat tech-facing company, if you won't get outright fired for being annoying, honestly, the fastest way to get access to things that might honestly be over your head or in general just might make your job easier is just to be pestering about it. If you ask the right people and you ask them enough, I think they tend to get exhausted and just hand it over at some point. And our final story of the day is from Wabisabi Girl. HOA wants me to build a shorter fence? Got it. I'm piggybacking off of the HOA trend going around here. This story was relayed to me by one of my favorite professors over five years ago. So apologies if the details are foggy or inaccurate. My professor was a very, very private person. 
the sort of guy who would hesitate to tell you his favorite color if you hadn't known him long enough. He had recently had an incredibly nosy couple move in next door and realized the flimsy four-foot fence he had got for the dog wouldn't keep out peeping eyes. So he installed a fence, but instead of using a standard size, which he knew his neighbors would peer over, he built an eight-foot fence. It wasn't even a week before HOA was on his butt, threatening every fine they could and claiming he couldn't have a fence over six feet tall. So, being a dutiful citizen, he called the fence company to uninstall said fence. While the fence was being taken down, he closely examined the HOA handbook on the precise definition of a fence. He installed a new six-foot fence that fit every single regulation, but with a three-foot brick wall beneath it. Respect to anybody that's going to spend their time reading through the HOA handbook to find any way that they can loophole their way into getting exactly what they want, cause screw overly controlling HOAs. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another malicious compliance story that was way crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video, or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.